Item number, SCP-006. Object class, safe. Special containment procedures. Whereas the nature of SCP-006 does not warrant any extensive containment, a certain level of secrecy is necessary regarding the object's existence and properties, for obvious reasons. The following procedures are required not for personnel safety, but to deny or hide knowledge of SCP-006's effects from the personnel who interact with it. 1. All personnel interacting with SCP-006 in any physical way are required to wear modified Class 6 BNC suits. Before personnel are allowed to perform procedures, they must be briefed with material SCP-006-B or SCP-006-C. SCP-006-A briefing is the correct one, and is restricted to only those with O5 clearance. To ensure personnel are wearing suits properly, they are to be submerged into a pool of water. Any air bubbles spotted signify a leak in the suit. 2. Procedures with SCP-006 are to be carried out under extreme surveillance. In case of contact with SCP-006, the commander in charge will announce Procedure 006-G-12, which the personnel have been briefed to believe to mean high toxicity is present and they must evacuate. 3. Any procedure in which liquid is acquired from SCP-006 must be approved by 305 level personnel. The liquid is to be transferred in a quad sealant container and under armed guard. 4. If at any time personnel come into contact with SCP-006 or liquid from SCP-006, they are to be confined and terminated after sufficient studies are done. Due to the nature of SCP-006, the most effective termination method is incineration. For full report, see file SCP-006-05. Description: SCP-006 is a very small spring located 60 kilometers west of Astrakhan. Foundation Command was aware of its existence since the 19th century, but were unable to secure it until 1991 due to political reasons. On the spot of the spring, a chemical factory has been constructed as a disguise, with the majority of laborers under Foundation and or Russian control. The liquid emitted from the spring has been chemically identified as simple mineral water in 1902, but has the unusual property of health. Ingesting the liquid produces the following properties in human beings. The ability to regenerate DNA damage by sufficient duplication, heightened excitement of cellular duplication, vastly improved abilities in the repair of damaged tissue, and a frightening increase in the effectiveness of the human immune system. Upon testing the liquid on animal subjects, hostile bacteria and viral agents were destroyed immediately. Many reptiles and birds were unaffected, while higher primates experienced the same benefits as humans. Item Number SCP-069 Object Class Safe Special Containment Procedures SCP-069 is currently impersonating former Foundation agent and is housed at Humanoid Containment Site 06-3. SCP-069 is to be provided with any reasonable requested item and or material, so long as such request does not violate Foundation security protocols. Special containment procedures have been modified. The following now applies. As SCP-069 is currently on suicide watch, all requests it makes must be approved by no fewer than two Level 3 personnel. If SCP-069 attempts to breach containment, it must be subdued using non-lethal methods. If SCP-069 dies, undercover agents are to be instructed to monitor reports of incidents in which individuals appear to have escaped certain death, and SCP-069 is to be recontained as soon as possible. Note. Despite the fact that SCP-069 is identical in all ways to said agent, it remains an active SCP in containment and is not to be treated as a Foundation employee. Any requests for classified information are to be denied, and visits from former co-workers without proper authorization are not allowed. Description: SCP-069 is a presumed humanoid entity, a variable appearance and gender. Through an unknown ability, 
Whenever SCP-069 is left alone with a recently deceased human body, the body will disappear, and SCP-069 will take on the appearance, mannerisms, and knowledge of the recently dead individual. Through extensive experimentation, it has been shown that SCP-069 is completely indistinguishable from the individual it impersonates, matching the original individual's fingerprints, DNA, and data expunged with nearly perfect precision. SCP-069 retains no knowledge of its abilities or former impersonations. SCP-069 responds normally to injury and pain, but if killed, will rapidly decay into dust regardless of any preservation attempts. SCP-069 will then re-emerge at the site of the most recent human death. There is no known maximum range to this effect, and so far has been observed in jumps of up to 675 kilometers. SCP-069 can impersonate a single individual indefinitely. However, it will gain an overriding urge to get their life in order, including but not limited to resolving any outstanding financial or personal obligations, visiting extended family, updating their will and testament, and other acts of closure. When questioned, SCP-069 professes no driving motivation other than a desire to straighten out their lives in the event of unforeseen injury or death. SCP-069 first came to the Foundation's attention in 1991 following reports of one John M., a firefighter who miraculously emerged alive from a three-alarm building fire in which two other firefighters and 11 civilians perished. Undercover agents attached to the local authorities were notified of a possible SCP when reports emerged that the firefighters' equipment had been damaged beyond recognition and that it had been deemed nearly impossible for the firefighter to emerge unscathed. Approximately three weeks later, then-presumed John M. responded to another large-scale building fire, during which he entered a smoke-filled room alone and was never found. A single civilian was rescued from the building, again nearly unharmed despite the heavy smoke reported within the building. SCP-069 was designated the following day and rendered into Foundation custody by members of Mobile Task Force Xi-3, Body Snatchers. Addendum 069-1 In 2000, Agent a guard on duty assigned to SCP-069, was killed during the containment breach of SCP- and subsequently impersonated by SCP-069. Although initially in denial after being formed of its identity, it has been mostly cooperative since its impersonation of a mid-level Foundation employee. Contingencies for the use of deceased Foundation employees for future SCP-069 use is under consideration. Addendum 069-2 In 2000, SCP-069 attempted to commit suicide after a junior researcher accidentally informed it that the family of Agent had been told that said agent was dead and of their subsequent reactions. Due to the massive cost of possibly having to recontain SCP-069, strict suicide watch measures are to be implemented. Plans to use other deceased Foundation employees as possible impersonation targets for SCP-069 have been suspended. Item Number SCP-104 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures SCP-104 is currently contained in a steel box with electronic keypad access. Access is to be restricted to Class 3 and higher. Do not allow SCP-104 to come in contact with any living tissue. Any and all interaction with SCP-104 is to be handled via robotic assistance or with full hazmat suits and gloves. Anyone found to be imprinted by SCP-104 must submit for unimprinting. Failure to do so within 24 hours of exposure will result in termination. Description: SCP-104 is a sphere, 35.5 centimeters or 14 inches around, and weighing 2.3 kilograms or 5 pounds. The outside is glass and very smooth, coating the sphere in a layer 6 millimeters or 0.2 inches thick. Under this layer is an extremely intricate design of very thin black and white lines. This inner core is a delicately carved ball of wood, giving slight texture to the line design. The design itself is unimaginably complex and seems to form something of a Rorschach test, as all viewers seem to have a different interpretation. Movement or a ticking sound from inside the sphere has been reported, 
but at this time is unconfirmed. Whenever a human touches SCP-104 in its unimprinted state, it will imprint on the subject. If the imprinted subject moves more than 9 meters or 30 feet from SCP-104 for more than 5 minutes, SCP-104 will appear within 2 meters or 7 feet of the imprinted subject. This shift appears instantaneous, disappearing and reappearing in less than a nanosecond, regardless of distance or intervening objects. Every hour that the subject remains within 9 meters or 30 feet of SCP-104, it will move one foot closer to the subject until it is touching the subject. When SCP-104 is touching its imprinted subject, it will not attempt to move closer. SCP-104 will not exhibit this behavior to non-imprinted subjects and will only imprint on one subject at a time. Thick cloth or metal appears to block the imprinting in most cases. Testing of SCP-104 with multiple instances of SCP-1680 suggests this imprinting is not genetically based, as SCP-104 does not change behaviors when faced with multiple genetically identical subjects. SCP-104 also appears to be indestructible, in that it always appears whole and undamaged after reappearing. Even after being crushed and incinerated, SCP-104 will reappear, whole and undamaged if its imprinted subject is outside of its minimum range for more than five minutes. SCP-104 causes paranoia and anger in most subjects, but this is not an effect of the sphere, as some are wholly unaffected by the constant presence of SCP-104, if slightly annoyed at times. SCP-104 can only be unimprinted if the subject is killed or enters a near-death-like state. SCP-104 will then enter its unimprinted state until touched. Thick gloves appear to block the imprinting process, as long as they are more than 13 millimeters or 0.5 inches thick. SCP-104 was recovered in a flea market from a man carrying it in a bowling bag. The man never identified himself and sold it to Agent for a quarter, thanking him profusely before running off. Notes 104-1108-R It has been theorized that SCP-104 is some form of extra-dimensional probe or recording device. This appears to be unlikely, as it appears to be made of terrestrial materials and has no means by which to record or observe anything. However, with few other explanations for its odd behavior, the theory is being investigated. Dr. Item Number SCP-127 Object Class Safe Special Containment Procedures SCP-127 is considered no more dangerous than a normal firearm of its type. However, due to its extraordinary properties, it is to be held in Weapons Locker 7C when not in use, and suspended in water rich in calcium and protein. At this time, only the research team assigned to SCP-127 has clearance to access it. Description: SCP-127, upon first glance, appears to be a standard MP5K submachine gun. Tests have revealed that aside from the outer steel shell, the entirety of the firearm is organic and alive. The weapon's ammunition initially appeared to be human-like teeth. However, DNA testing of the bullets resulted in no match to any known species on Earth. SCP-127 features two settings, semi-automatic and fully automatic. An audible groan can be heard when switching between the two. Upon depleting the weapon's magazine, typically 60 shots, it takes between 3 to 5 days to regrow a new supply of ammunition. Attempts to remove the magazine have resulted in failure. It seems to be permanently attached to the weapon. SCP-127 does not seem capable of reproduction at this time. Scans have shown no apparent reproductive organs, and requires no sustenance beyond water, calcium, and protein. SCP-127 was originally located in the house of a Mr. James who was found dead from a heart attack on the night of November 17, 1991. Coroner's reports state that Mr. died sometime in the morning of November 8th, but was not noticed missing until more than a week later. No complications or unusual circumstances were found to lead to his death. Due to his extensive gun collection, the ATF and FBI were notified to collect his weapons. SCP-127 was discovered during testing and cataloging, and was promptly collected by SCP agents. Addendum Reclassified as safe in 1990
Item Number SCP-135 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures SCP-135 is to be contained in a partitioned plexiglass chamber, at least 7 meters to a side. All sections are to be completely sealed off from one another to avoid cross-contamination. SCP-135 itself is to be in a central section, with 1.0 to 1.5 square meters of floor space, with a 5 centimeter wide runoff trench around the perimeter that drains into a tank, the contents of which are to be piped into an incinerator at the end of every week. The remaining space in the containment chamber is to be used to house five chemical harvesting vats, one vat per partitioned section. A single access corridor is to lead from SCP-135 section to outside the chamber. No personnel are permitted within SCP-135's effect radius. All maintenance, taking of samples, etc. are to be carried out by remote control robots. Disciplinary measures need not be taken against personnel that violate this rule because the direct consequences of SCP-135's effects have been deemed consequence enough. Robots are to be maintained and cleaned by Level 1 personnel. Once a week, SCP-135 section is to be hosed down with solution U-82B until only its outer coating is visible. In emergencies, flamethrowers may be employed to reduce mass quickly. Due to the potential catastrophic effects in the event of cross-contamination, at no point are SCP-329 or SCP-427 to be contained within the same facility as SCP-135. Description: SCP-135 is a human female, age undisclosed, that promotes rapid, uncontrolled cell growth within a radius of 2.25 meters from itself. It remains rigidly in the fetal position and has never been observed to move. SCP-135's effect is carcinogenic to animal tissue and induces malignant neoplasia in plant and fungal tissues in 100% of recorded exposure cases, with severity and disorganization increasing exponentially with closer proximity to SCP-135. Within 0.1 meters, cells will not die, even under conditions where they would normally, causing SCP-135 to be steadily buried under a continually growing mass of plant matter, fungal matter, and microorganisms. This undying state extends to SCP-135 cells as well. SCP-135 has been shown to lack an epidermis, instead having a crust of mixed plant and fungal matter that has incorporated itself onto SCP-135's skin, interspersed with tumors and patches of raw dermis. SCP-135's lungs, diaphragm, and intestines are ruptured, and growth extends into the chest and abdominal cavities. It has been fitted with wide diameter plastic tubes for use in draining excess biomatter. The Foundation came into possession of SCP-135 after it and a surrounding ball of growth rolled off a cliff in the mountains, crushing a hiker on the trail below. Class B amnestics were administered to the civilians and law enforcement personnel involved, and the incident was covered up as having been caused by a pair of male goats that slipped and fell off the cliff edge during a dominance battle. Later examination of the growth revealed the partial skeleton of an adult human female, with osteosarcomata covering 1% of it. SCP-135 was found in the space between the skeleton's ribcage and pelvis. A viable DNA sample was recovered from the bone marrow of the pelvis, and testing confirmed that the skeleton belonged to SCP-135's biological mother. All personnel involved with SCP-135's retrieval and initial testing were later diagnosed with various forms of cancer. Out of the affected, only are still alive at the time of this writing. Attempts to terminate SCP-135 with sustained gunfire, flamethrowers, caustic materials, vacuum, and extreme pressure have all failed. Further termination attempts are forbidden by Order of O5 due to SCP-135's potential uses in cultivating useful bacteria. EEGs confirm full brain activity. No attempts to communicate with SCP-135 are to be made at this time. Item Number SCP-136 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures No extraordinary containment procedures are necessary. SCP-136 is to be kept in a standard 10 meter by 10 meter by 10 meter concrete containment room. SCP-136-1 is to be kept in a locked, transparent plastic case, measuring 0.5 meters by 0.5 meters by 0.5 meters, placed on a table in the center of the room. 
Video surveillance is unnecessary when SCP-136 is not being actively examined. As of Incident I-136-C, only Class D personnel may enter the SCP-136 containment chamber more than once in any 30-day period without special authorization from Director Description SCP-136 has no effect on non-humans. SCP-136 describes two phenomena. SCP-136-1 is a variable appearance, but generally manifests as a crude clay, wood, metal, or cloth doll, usually identifiable as female, and usually between 10 and 30 centimeters in length. The doll appears as male in approximately 10% of viewings. SCP-136-1 has no unusual properties that can be measured empirically. Mass spectrometry of samples taken from the doll return typical results for its present material. When the doll is damaged to the extent where it no longer appears human, usually upon removal of the head or all limbs, it vanishes completely and reappears in a new configuration within a one meter radius. Testing of complete vaporization pending. SCP-136-2 manifests only when SCP-136-1 is viewed for approximately 20 minutes, though like SCP-136-1, it has a somewhat variable form. The first indication of SCP-136-2's presence is a sound of laughter of a gender corresponding to the appearance of SCP-136-1. Personnel who hear the laughter report it as sounding creepy or scary. The laughter lasts for an interval of anywhere from 5 seconds to 2 minutes, after which is a period of silence, usually of about 5 minutes. After the period of silence, SCP-136-2 appears, along with the abrupt disappearance of SCP-136-1. SCP-136-2 is an incorporeal nude or partially nude figure, corresponding to the gender of SCP-136-1. SCP-136-2 ranging in size from 1.9 to 2.1 meters, is always posed in a provocative manner and moves through the air at a slow walking pace of 0.2 meters a second toward the subjects. If more than one subject is present, each will see the form as moving towards him or herself. As it approaches, the volume of the laughter increases. By the time SCP-136-2 is within 1 to 2 meters, the subject invariably has gone rigid in fear, collapsed, or backed up until he or she hits a wall. SCP-136-2 usually remains stiff until it is within approximately 5 centimeters of the subject, whereupon it will scream once before vanishing. 10 to 15 seconds later, SCP-136-1 will reappear in its previous location in a different configuration. The apparition has a very disturbing appearance. Its mouth is far too wide, frozen in a rictus of pain and arousal. It will occasionally bare its teeth or lick its lips. Its irises take up almost the entire sclera of its eyes, which appear mad and bloodshot. If female, it will have an absurdly narrow waist and large breasts. The experience of viewing SCP-136-2 is profoundly upsetting and has universally caused night terrors for up to six months in every single subject possibly as a result of its psychic intrusion. After a viewing, most subjects are unable to leave the containment room without assistance. Interestingly, Class D personnel with a history of sexual deviancy still experience a strong negative reaction to 136-2. Additional information. SCP-136 was recovered from the children's bedroom of an abandoned house and data expunged that was reportedly haunted. A routine sweep of such reported homes by Foundation personnel discovered SCP-136 when Agent <laughs> fell from a second-story window, screaming. Incident Reports Incident I-136-A Dr. Simon was the 25th subject to observe 136-2 and the 4th to do so voluntarily. The viewing proceeded in the usual manner with no anomalies. Approximately two hours after viewing 136-2, Dr. Simon who was in the break room with several other researchers, screamed and dropped his coffee mug. He incoherently indicated that he could see 136-2 floating down the hall towards him. Dr. Morris and Dr. Harrison restrained him, assuming that he had simply been badly shaken by the experience. After approximately two minutes, all present in the room fell unconscious. Dr. Saboya recovered first and proceeded to awaken her colleagues. Dr. Simon had lapsed into a coma 
and died three days later. Dr. Myers requests reclassification to Keter class. Reclassification as Keter class denied. We cannot dismiss the possibility that the unfortunate incident wasn't caused by some other telepathic SCP. Incident I-136B. It happened again today. Agent shoved a few Class Ds into the room, and he was standing outside. 136 finished doing its thing, and I was helping them drag the subjects out of the room when everything went black. I woke up to Agent smacking me in the face, and three Class Ds in comas. This thing is killing people. We haven't learned anything new from it in ten years, and we can't use it. I request that we find a way to terminate 136, maybe get a psychic SCP in here with it. It's not like burning it will do anything. Dr. Myers. Request for termination denied. 136 is proving valuable for enhanced interrogation. Incident I-136C. This is out of control now. You all saw what happened. Hell, everyone in a thousand yards will never forget data expunged. And the Class D in the room is gone, and nobody knows how. At the very least, we need to do some more rigorous screening of the Ds before sending them in. We would have found out that he was data expunged ahead of time. Thank God we figured out what set it off, though. Request reclassification to Keter and permission for attempted termination of 136. Dr. Myers. Request denied. Dr. Myers is to be removed from administration of SCP-136. Disposition of 136 is to be given directly to Overseer and Dr. for exclusive use in enhanced interrogation. Item number, SCP-204, Object Class, Keter. Special Containment Procedures, SCP-204-1 and SCP-204-2 are to be kept in a 10 meter by 10 meter fortified holding area. In sight, the holding area must be constructed out of armor-plated steel and heavily reinforced concrete. The holding area must also be vacuum sealed and contained within an outer shell with a higher air pressure that must be always maintained, with at least two PSI over the current air pressure in the holding area. At least one full security team must be kept on standby at all times. It is only during SCP-2041's scheduled feeding times that D-Class personnel are allowed to enter, for the purposes of maintenance. SCP-2041's typical diet consists of any kind of meat, preferably from living subjects. Such subjects will often consist of aggressive animals, such as wild dogs, bulls, or any other animal that must be euthanized due to aggression. However, D-Class personnel will also suffice, if such food sources are unavailable. SCP-2042's diet consists of a regular human diet, with no special measures given. SCP-2042 is allowed to make special requests, but any and all requests must be given O5 approval. Any personnel caught attempting to deliberately provoke SCP-2042 will be immediately terminated. Security personnel are required to ignore any and all of SCP-2042's attempts to provoke a response from them, unless there is a clear and present risk of containment breach. Failure to do so will result in harsh administrative punishment. When SCP-2042 is about to turn the age of 14, the Foundation must initiate Containment Protocol 204. Further details may be found in Containment Protocol 204 requirements. In the event of a containment breach, EMP generators must be immediately activated in order to keep SCP-2041 disabled. Once EMP generators have been activated, security teams have approximately 30 seconds to neutralize SCP-2042 before SCP-2041 can adapt and reassemble itself. If containment cannot be achieved in this time, SCP-2041 must be contained by conventional means. Security teams and agents are authorized to use any conventional weaponry at their disposal to contain SCP-2041 and SCP-2042. If SCP-2042 is terminated during containment, then Containment Protocol 204 must immediately be initiated. Description SCP-2041 is a semi-organic nanomachine colony that follows SCP-2042 as a form of protector. SCP-2041 spends the majority of its time in a dispersed cloud, where it is almost impossible to perceive with normal human senses. However, 
If SCP-2042 is put into danger, or if SCP-2042 commands it to, SCP-2041 will instantaneously materialize into a solid, physical form. The exact shape and nature of this form is subjective, depending wholly upon SCP-2042's view, state of mind, and imagination. Despite its variable nature, SCP-2041 has a number of common traits. These include massive strength, large size, basic intelligence, perfect obedience to SCP-2042, and the ability to regenerate itself after consuming living flesh. SCP-2041 is vulnerable to conventional weaponry and can be temporarily forced back into its dispersed state if enough damage is inflicted. SCP-2042 is always a child, ranging from 4 to 14 years old. Physically, there is nothing outstanding about SCP-2042 besides its ability to call upon SCP-2041. All incidences of SCP-2042 have common traits. All of them have had a history of abuse and danger, with many developing acute mental disorders as a result. This makes instances of SCP-2042 difficult to contain in any traditional manner, as great care must be taken to keep them in a stable state. It appears that SCP-2041 is attracted to such children, though why or how it finds them is currently unknown. If SCP-2042 is terminated or reaches the age of 14, then SCP-2041 will abandon it and find a new child to imprint on. As a form of self-preservation, if SCP-2041 cannot find a suitable child, it will immediately materialize and go berserk, attacking anything in sight. Once SCP-2041 finds a suitable candidate to protect, it immediately imprints upon SCP-2042 and will follow it until SCP-2042 expires or until SCP-2041 decides to leave of its own accord. At first, SCP-2041 appears benign, protecting SCP-2042 from overt threats. However, through careful study and observation, it has been noted that all incidences of SCP-2042 begin to adopt much more aggressive, danger-seeking behavior with little regard for human life. It is theorized that SCP-2041 is able to manipulate SCP-2042's thought processes in order to behave in a fashion that would benefit it. It is assumed that since SCP-2041 requires organic flesh for sustenance, it needs SCP-2042 to be in danger in order to justify its activation. Addendum 1 There have been numerous recorded incidences where it is believed that SCP-2041 has been involved. The first such recorded incident was when a car was found in a residential street, completely torn apart and covered in partially devoured human remains. Similar incidents occurred until agents managed to track SCP-2041 to where they made contact with the first recorded incarnation of SCP-2042. It took three more attempts and numerous casualties before SCP-2041 and SCP-2042 were successfully contained. Interviews with SCP-2042 revealed that it seemed to feel a need to experience danger, such as standing in traffic or provoking hostile responses from others. When questioned on its reasons, SCP-2042 simply replied that SCP-2041 allowed it to. Containment Protocol 204 In order to keep SCP-2041 successfully contained, it has been necessary to keep a permanent stock of candidates to replace SCP-2042 in the event that the current one is terminated or abandoned. Ideally, all candidates should be orphans, below the age of 10, with a history of abuse. However, in times of need, Article 12 of Containment Protocol 204 may be authorized to allow candidates that don't meet specific requirements. They will be put under the supervision of caretakers which will consist of D-class personnel convicted of violent crimes and with Foundation staff present to prevent inadvertent termination of candidates. If SCP-2042 successfully reaches the cutoff age of 14 years and SCP-2041 abandons it, the former SCP-2042 must undergo a rigorous amnestic treatment and a thorough psychological examination 
before being reintegrated into a government foster program. If it is deemed that the former SCP-2042 cannot be successfully reintegrated, then the subject must be immediately terminated. Addendum 2. As of the writing of this report, the Foundation has contained 13 instances of SCP-2042. Eleven instances exhibited the trademark hostile and violent behavior typical among all instances of SCP-2042. However, two instances of SCP-2042 showed a marked improvement in their mental health and stability, and had the lowest number of containment breach attempts. It is currently unclear what specific factors trigger these differences in behavior, as the exact mechanism SCP-2041 uses to manipulate its host is still unknown. Addendum 3 Though there is evidence to suggest that SCP-2041 may be sentient, or possibly even sapient, all attempts to communicate directly with SCP-2041 have resulted in failure. Currently, the only feasible method of communicating with SCP-2041 is to use SCP-2042 as an intermediary. Unfortunately, the violent tendencies and hostile behavior exhibited by nearly all instances of SCP-2042, as well as their questionable mental stability, make this approach highly unreliable. Item Number SCP-241 Object Class Safe Special Containment Procedures SCP-241 is to be kept at Site-19, using standard operating procedures for containing safe class book and manuscript type SCPs, with the following additional conditions. SCP-241 must be kept open on a flat surface, with restraints across opposing pages of the open book to keep it from closing accidentally. Containment devices must be checked at least once a week for structural integrity. Any anomalies must be reported immediately to Site Command. Access to SCP-241 is restricted. Any and all usage of SCP-241 must be logged. SCP-241 must be transported in an authorized book stand, such that it cannot accidentally be closed in transit. In the event that SCP-241 is opened outside of a testing environment, the last person to have touched it must report to the nearest infirmary, and a D-Class personnel must close and reopen SCP-241. Description SCP-241 appears as a normal book, 33 cm x 23 cm x 3.5 cm, entitled Good Home Cooking. The cover of SCP-241 is a red and white checkerboard pattern, with the title in simple black letters on the front and spine. When open, SCP-241 contains 99 recipes, sorted into typical sections of a cookbook. Many of these recipes include a picture of the dish that is invariably appetizing, and a small percentage will call for rare or exotic ingredients. Whenever SCP-241 is opened by a subject, known as the target, different from the one who last opened it, i.e. the previous target, the recipes contained in the book change. Preliminary investigations concluded that if the target eats a dish prepared from one of the recipes in SCP-241, that person soon dies from apparent anaphylactic shock. Others who eat the same dish are not similarly affected. Testing has been authorized to determine the exact nature of SCP-241's effects. SCP-241 appears to be impervious to getting dirty and to at least minor damage. For example, Sauces splashed onto its pages disappear almost immediately, and torn pages and nicks on the cover are repaired within seconds. Research on SCP-241 continues, including potential interaction with other SCP items. Experiment Log 241-L02 Supplemental Testing on SCP-241 Just as in initial testing, all tests on SCP-241 were carried out in test kitchens at Site-19 using D-Class personnel for test subjects, unless otherwise indicated. Test 24121 Subject Subject 241J was chosen from general population. Health screenings indicate subject is allergic to peanuts. Procedure Subject was instructed to close and open SCP-241 several times at prescribed intervals. Each time SCP-241 was opened, the complete contents of SCP-241 were recorded and transcribed while subject underwent testing. Results 
Test results indicated the subject's allergy to peanuts worsened each time subject opened SCP-241. Subject's allergy was most affected the first time he opened SCP-241, and subsequently opening SCP-241 appears to have diminishing effects. However, subject's allergy worsened from mild to severe. Most of the recipes in SCP-241 reappeared when subject closed and reopened SCP-241. Between 11 and 17 inclusive new recipes appeared each time SCP-241 was reopened. Recipes that had been replaced did not reappear. Only one exotic recipe was replaced, after subject had opened SCP-241 for the fourth time. Analysis the effects of SCP-241 appear to follow the law of diminishing returns. SCP-241 also appears to tailor its choice of recipes to the specific condition of the target, though much more testing would be necessary to prove that theory. Suggest analysis of recipes offered during normal testing of SCP-241. Test 2422 Subject Subject 241K is a rhesus monkey. Health screenings indicated no apparent food allergies or other health problems. Procedure Subject was introduced to SCP-241 and encouraged to open it by handlers. Handlers were instructed to keep subject from closing SCP-241 again. Results Subject eventually opened SCP-241, and handlers kept it open for analysis. The contents of SCP-241 were consistent with previous results for a target with a shellfish allergy though again unique for the target. Testing confirmed subject had developed an allergy to shellfish. A dish was prepared from SCP-241 by Subject 241-F and presented to Subject 241-K. Subject 241-K ate the meal without hesitation and nine minutes later was dead from anaphylactic shock, consistent with previous testing. Analysis SCP-241 is just as effective on certain non-humans as it is on humans. The working theory now is that SCP-241 works on anything potentially susceptible to food allergies that can and does open SCP-241. Test 24123 Subject Subject 241-L is a robot designed for remote manipulation of hazardous materials. Procedure Subject was remote controlled by who was instructed to have the subject open SCP-241. Results Subject opened SCP-241 via remote control. The contents of SCP-241 were identical to before it was closed previously. Analysis SCP-241 apparently does not respond to inorganic targets. Test 24124 Subject Subject 241M-859E was chosen from general population. Health screenings indicated no allergies. Procedure Subject was exposed to SCP-859 via touch. Subject then placed within an MOPP-4 containment suit. Subject was given SCP-241 and instructed to open it and to keep it open. Results Tests on skin sample taken from subject confirm development of severe allergy to spider venom, as per usual with contact with SCP-859. SCP-241 retained its previous set of recipes. Analysis SCP-241 apparently requires physical contact with subject. Test 24125 Subject Subject 241M-859E Procedure Subject given a standard Class D uniform. Subject was given SCP-241 and instructed to open it. Results Subject dropped SCP-241 to the floor and began screaming. Subject given a mild sedative. SCP-241 contained a set of arachnid-based and themed recipes. The meal, Mr. Skeleton's Halloween Spider Snacks, was selected and prepared from SCP-241 by Subject 241-F. Due to Subject 241-M-859-E having severe arachnophobia, data expunged. Within two minutes, the subject experienced breathing difficulties and partial paralysis. This was closely followed by the typical symptoms of anaphylaxis. Immediate administration of epinephrine did not prevent the subject from expiring. Analysis 
Although the images found in SCP-241 are typically considered pleasing or appetizing, it does not seem to have any particular sentience. Autopsy confirmed the presence of venom and neurotoxins produced by the Brazilian wandering spider. End Experiment Log Directive 241-S06 In light of recent test results with SCP-241, no further testing of SCP-241 on personnel without pre-existing food allergies is authorized, without Level 4 security clearance. Testing may continue on personnel with pre-existing food allergies. 05 Directive 241-S09 Reclassification of SCP-241 to Euclid class is denied. Honestly, the cookbook? Leave it in its room and everything's fine. It's no one else's fault if you don't know what you're allergic to and don't bother to find out beforehand. Unless you're cooking for your significant other, then you'd better know. 05 Directive 241-S11 Cross testing SCP-241 with other SCPs will be considered on a case-by-case -case basis. Exposure to SCP-682 has already been considered and denied. 05 Addendum 1 Acquisition Summary The Foundation became aware of SCP-241 in April 2000 while investigating reports of a Black Widow in said subject had been married four times and all four of her husbands had died shortly after eating a meal at home. However, since authorities never found evidence of foul play, Subject was never charged with any crime. Subsequent interviews with Subject by Foundation personnel revealed the existence of SCP-241, at which time SCP-241 was seized by Foundation agents. Subject revealed that she had first realized there was something unusual with SCP-241 when data expunged. Addendum 2 Initial Testing Log All tests on SCP-241 were carried out in test kitchens at Site-19, using D-Class personnel for test subjects, unless otherwise noted. Test 241-1 Subject Subject 241-A was chosen from general population. No unusual traits selected for. Procedure Subject 241A was presented SCP-241 while closed and instructed to open it, choose a recipe, prepare it, and eat it while giving feedback during the entire process. Results Before exposure to SCP-241, Subject declared that he had never cooked anything more complicated than ramen noodles. Subject opened SCP-241, reporting nothing unusual. Subject looked through recipes in SCP-241 choosing sautéed scallops in a white wine sauce. Subject prepared the sautéed scallops from the recipe in SCP-241 and when complete, remarked that he did not know he could do that. Subject declared that the prepared dish smelled fantastic and while eating it, declared, This is the best thing I've ever eaten. Three minutes after completing the meal, Subject started showing symptoms of anaphylactic shock. Subject was treated with emergency doses of epinephrine but treatment was not effective. Subject died from anaphylactic shock six minutes afterward, later confirmed by autopsy. A subsequent examination of SCP-241 revealed that 81 of its recipes called for shellfish. SCP-241 was left open. Analysis Results are consistent with previous descriptions of the effects of SCP-241. Test 241-2 Subject Subject 241B was chosen from general population. Subject reports no known allergies to scallops or other shellfish. Procedure SCP-241 was still open from test 241-1. Subject 241B was instructed to not close SCP-241, find the sautéed scallops recipe, prepare it, and eat it, while giving feedback during the entire process. Results before exposure to SCP-241, Subject expressed doubt that he'd be able to prepare the sautéed scallops recipe. After preparing the dish, Subject expressed surprise that he had done so, similarly to the reaction of Subject 241-A, and said that the dish smells pretty good. While eating, Subject declared that the dish was pretty good, and again expressed surprise that he had cooked it. Subject did not suffer anaphylactic shock or any other adverse effect after completing the meal.
post-testing observation of subject revealed no long-term effects from eating the dish. SCP-241 was left open. Analysis Results are consistent with previous descriptions of the effects of SCP-241. Suspect that SCP-241 may somehow improve the cooking skill of whoever is preparing the dish. Test 241-3 Subject Subjects 241-C and 241-D were chosen from general population. Both subjects report no skill in cooking and no allergies to shellfish. Procedure SCP-241 was still open from test 2412. Subject 241-C was instructed to not close SCP-241, find the sautéed scallops recipe, and transcribe it to a standard sheet of paper. In a separate test kitchen, Subject 241-D was given the transcribed recipe and instructed to prepare and eat the dish prepared. Results Subject 241-C found and transcribed the recipe without incident. The transcribed recipe was visually compared to the recipe in SCP-241 and confirmed to be identical. SCP-241 was left open. Subject displayed no adverse effects from interaction with SCP-241. Subject 241-D was given the transcribed recipe and attempted to prepare the sautéed scallops, but experienced difficulty and frustration, several times declaring, I told you guys I can't cook. The completed dish did not look or smell nearly as good as in previous tests. Subject balked at eating the dish, saying that it smells like but was persuaded to eat it. Subject ate approximately 40% of the meal before stating, I'm gonna be sick, at which time subject vomited. Subject was instructed to finish the meal, but subject responded, data expunged. Termination of subject considered, but rejected in favor of further testing. Analysis More evidence that SCP-241 can improve the cooking skill of its user. Subject 241-D retained for further testing. Test 241-4 Subject Subject 241-D Procedure SCP-241 was still open from Test 241-3. Subject 241-D was instructed to not close SCP-241, find the sautéed scallops recipe, prepare it, and eat it, while giving feedback during the entire process. Results Subject vociferously protested to having to eat her own cooking, but was persuaded to cooperate, with the promise that subject would not have to eat the resultant dish if it turned out like in the previous test. Subject expressed skepticism but proceeded to prepare the sautéed scallops recipe. While cooking the dish, subject experienced none of the difficulties she experienced from the previous test, instead expressing the now familiar surprise that her cooking was turning out so well. The completed dish looked and smelled similar to the results of test 241-2. The subject was not nearly as reluctant to eat the prepared dish, declaring it not bad, not bad at all. Subject did not appear to suffer from any adverse effects after eating the dish. During post-testing interviews, Subject was asked how she was able to prepare the sautéed scallops during this test, when the results of the previous test were so unappetizing. Subject stated that she did not know, only that once she started cooking the dish, it became perfectly clear to her how to do it. Subject did not appear to have any additional knowledge of cooking and even had trouble remembering the cooking techniques she used in this test. Analysis There is now little doubt that SCP-241 can turn people who know nothing about cooking into gourmet chefs, at least for the dish that's being prepared. Test 241-11 Subject Subjects 241-E and 241-F were chosen from general population. Subject 241-E is known to have an allergy to peanuts. Subject 241-F has demonstrated considerable skill as a chef. Procedure Subject 241-E was presented with SCP-241 while closed and instructed to open it and choose a recipe. Subject 241-F was then instructed to prepare the selected meal from SCP-241. The prepared dish was given to Subject 241-E, who was then asked to eat it. Results Subject 241-E opened SCP-241 and, while looking through the recipes offered, stated that all the recipes called for peanuts, adding, peanuts mess me up something fierce. 
Subject found a few recipes that did not include peanuts and selected an Australian carrot cake. Subject 241F prepared the carrot cake from SCP-241 and remarked that the finished product was better than he expected. The cake was presented to Subject 241E, who started eating without prompting or hesitation. Subject stated that the cake was the best thing I've ever eaten and ate nearly half the cake before claiming satiation. Within two minutes, Subject started showing symptoms of anaphylactic shock. Subject was administered epinephrine, which was ineffective, and died four minutes later. Autopsy confirmed anaphylactic shock as the cause of death. The recipes in SCP-241 were examined, and 85 of the 99 recipes called for peanuts or peanut products, but the Australian carrot cake was not one of them. The carrot cake and seven other recipes included lupin flour. A quick search found that lupin flour can induce an anaphylactic reaction in those who suffer from peanut allergies. The remaining six recipes called for more… exotic ingredients. SCP-241 remained open. The remaining half of the cake was saved for further testing. Analysis Reactions of subjects 241E and 241F were both consistent with prior observations. The selection of recipes supports the theory that SCP-241 somehow determines the substance that the target is most allergic to and offers recipes to specifically induce a fatal allergic reaction in the target. Test 241-12 Subject Subject 241F Procedure Subject 241F was instructed to prepare the six dishes that contain neither peanuts nor lupin flour. The dishes were turned over for analysis. The six recipes were transcribed. Results Data expunged Analysis Data expunged Subject 241F showed no apparent ill effects from preparing seven different dishes from SCP-241 in quick succession. Recommended retaining subject to study long-term effects of secondary, i.e. not as the target, exposure to SCP-241. Test 241-13 Subject Subject 241G was chosen from general population and is known to have an allergy to peanuts. Procedure Subject was instructed to eat the remaining cake from Test 241-11. Results Subject asked if the cake contained peanuts and was assured that it did not. Subject stated that he didn't much like carrot cake. Subject started eating the cake, remarking that the cake was pretty good actually. Subject consumed approximately 75% of the remaining cake before declaring satiation. After seven minutes, subject started showing signs of anaphylactic shock. Epinephrine was administered, and subject was stabilized. Subject eventually recovered, although recovery time was somewhat longer than expected. Analysis It appears that, although the recipes from SCP-241 are potentially hazardous to anyone susceptible to the allergen in question, SCP-241's recipes are most potent against the target. Test 241-14 Subject Subject 241H was chosen from general population. According to complete health screenings, subject has no food allergies. Procedure Subject was instructed to open SCP-241 and leave it open for analysis. Results Analysis of SCP-241 showed that 79 of the recipes on its pages called for chicken eggs or egg-based products. 15 of the remaining recipes called for eggs. The other five recipes data expunged. These five recipes were transcribed. Subject 241H stated that she had never experienced any problems eating eggs before. Subject was presented with one dozen hard-boiled chicken eggs and was instructed to eat them. Subject asked for salt and pepper, granted, and proceeded to eat the eggs. While eating the third egg, subject started complaining of stomach pain. Subject was instructed to continue eating and she begrudgingly continued. Upon ingesting her seventh egg, subject collapsed on the floor, doubled over in pain. Within 60 seconds, subject started showing signs of anaphylactic shock. Epinephrine was administered, and subject was stabilized. Subject recovered, within the expected recovery time for such an episode. Analysis 
We now have evidence that SCP-241 somehow induces or amplifies an allergy in the target when SCP-241 is opened. This ability would explain how SCP-241 is able to cause an allergic reaction in targets without pre-existing food allergies. Addendum 3 Notes from Cross-Testing To determine the effects of SCP-241's recipes on subjects that either cannot eat or do not require sustenance, approval was given to cross-test SCP-241 on SCP-1770. Upon subject opening the book, the contents were identical to before it was closed previously. This confirms results of Test 241-23, in which SCP-241 does not respond to inorganic subjects. Item Number SCP-310 Object Class Safe Special Containment Procedures When not used in experimentation, SCP-310 is to be kept in a 0.3 meter by 0.3 meter by 0.3 meter sealed vacuum case, composed of flame retardant material. The research chamber surrounding the vacuum case shall be similarly flame retardant, and be kept saturated with carbon dioxide, nitrogen, or other fire extinguishing agent when testing is not taking place. Standard Foundation protocols to prevent unauthorized access should be kept in place. No flammable or semi-flammable substances are permitted within the research chamber, except small quantities, for research purposes. Authorization is required for testing on live or otherwise self-propelling test subjects. Chamber is to be kept sealed during testing, and emergency vacuum system is to remain active. All personnel are forbidden to wear loose clothing when in chamber. Long hair must be kept tied up. Flame retardant suits are recommended. Memo number 310-AA For the last time, loose clothing includes ties. Regardless of the normal dress code encouraged on site, we want to avoid any more cases like Dr. F. No item should be worn that might allow accidental contact with SCP-310. Dr. John Drake Any object which contacts SCP-310 is to remain in the chamber until fully consumed. Any item or clothing contacting SCP-310 is to be removed as expeditiously as possible, while preventing further contact. Any limb or extremity contacting SCP-310 is to be removed immediately. Surgical tools, including bone saws, are to be kept on hand for this eventuality, as well as bolt cutters and power saws, in case time factors prevent a more controlled amputation from being performed. Any Class D personnel contacting SCP-310 are to be immediately terminated. If exposure of SCP-310 to Class D personnel is part of test procedure, it is recommended that the test subject is restrained prior to exposure to prevent further accidental contact. The research chamber is to remain sealed until all objects exposed to SCP-310 are fully consumed. Therefore, it is recommended to limit size of test subjects to prevent lengthy lockdowns of research chamber. Description SCP-310 is a 157mm tall white candle composed of apparently standard tallow. SCP-310 is an unmarked 33mm diameter cylinder with tapered tip, out of which emerges 7mm of wick. When not immersed in an oxygen-free medium, the wick produces a steady 24mm tall flame. This flame can be extinguished through most conventional means. Removal of oxygen, immersion in non-flammable fluid, application of sudden intense airflow. However, on the removal of the inhibiting factor, the flame immediately reappears, behaving much like a standard trick candle. Only a small amount of tallow is liquefied at the base of the wick and is not consumed by the flame. Even during the longest duration removed from containment, at no time during these weeks was the tallow level nor the overall height of SCP-310 observed to decrease. Other than its interaction with the flame of SCP-310, the tallow itself is not unusual in any respect. Tallow removed from SCP-310 is designated SCP-310-1 and is classified safe. It is easily cut and as malleable as would be expected. It also melts and burns as normal when exposed to ordinary flame. 
Any tallow removed from SCP-310 is slowly replaced by unknown means. If SCP-310 is cut short, tallow will grow from the lit section until the original 157 millimeters of height and unblemished appearance are restored. In one experiment, SCP-310 was placed in a heat chamber, melting the entire volume of tallow so only the wick remained. The flame remained lit, even without fuel, and gradually exuded tallow until its original state was restored. Any flammable or semi-flammable substance which comes into contact with SCP-310 becomes ignited with a slow-spreading fire. Unlike the flame of SCP-310, this fire cannot be extinguished by any known means other than exhausting its fuel supply. Experiments have shown that the fire will continue to burn, even in a vacuum, underwater, in a nitrogen-saturated environment, under intense airflow, in a refrigerated environment, encased in a fire-retardant covering, or any combination of the above. Only total consumption of all flammable material in contact with the flames will result in them becoming extinguished. Any object ignited by SCP-310 are designated SCP-310-2 and are classified Euclid until fully consumed, whereupon they revert to safe classification. Therefore, in the case of accidental ignition, especially of personnel, separating the lit section from the rest of object as soon as possible is the only way to preserve the rest of the exposed object. SCP-310-2 objects are also capable of spreading to other flammable or semi-flammable objects, resulting in further SCP-310-2 type objects. The implications of such possibility for chain reaction are worrisome. Tests have shown that bodily contact with SCP-310 is similar to normal immolation, that is, highly painful and damaging. Damage is somewhat more extensive than that of normal flames, probably due to inability to extinguish and the unusually slow rate of spread of SCP-310-2. No unusual psychic or memetic properties have been observed. The means by which SCP-310-2 objects are able to continue burning despite all efforts to extinguish is unknown. It is also unknown why SCP-310 itself is so easy to extinguish albeit temporarily. Recovery SCP-310 was recovered from the charred remains of a hamlet outside of UK. The isolated nature of the site is probably responsible for the containment of the resulting blaze, which firefighters had battled unsuccessfully for eight hours before abandoning the buildings to the flames. In the subsequent investigation, seven people expired, either through contact with SCP-310 or cross-contact with earlier victims. The event drew Foundation attention, and SCP-310 was recovered without incident, due to precautions taken by Agent T based on existing evidence. A further investigation of the site revealed that it was being used as a data expunged. The involvement of that organization may go some way to explaining why SCP-310 was located where it was, what it had been used for, and how it started the blaze that led to its recovery by the Foundation. However, the question of SCP-310's origin is still open. Item Number SCP-321 Object Class Safe Special Containment Procedures SCP-321 is to be kept in a regulation containment chamber SCP-321 has been outfitted with extensive braces to make up for weaknesses in bone structure and muscle mass. Its artificial heart is to be examined once a month for any damage. SCP-321 is to be fed three times daily. Solid foods are excluded from its prescribed diet. Three staff members are on temporary SCP-321 assignment at this time. SCP-321 is to be given three hours a day of exercise and physical therapy with the rest of its time not involved in experiments to be confined to its cell. While SCP-321 is incapable of asking for anything, it has been allowed several stuffed toys. Description SCP-321 is a human female, born on July 4th, 18... SCP-321 is currently 3.1 meters tall, 
and weighs approximately 110 kilograms. Subject is devoid of melanin in hair, eyes, and skin. It is incapable of speech, but can still vocalize, and has proven to have problems with spatial recognition and awareness. SCP-321 has displayed a low degree of intellect, and has problems adjusting to new situations. SCP-321 was the stillborn child of junior researcher Adam and his wife, medical assistant Evelyn Junior researcher took it upon himself to make use of several SCPs, including SCP-590, in an effort to bring his daughter back to life. The procedure worked, but the result was taken into Foundation custody for examination. The subject was later given an SCP designation. SCP-321 was quickly found to have recuperative abilities capable of healing injuries inflicted upon it at approximately five times the normal rate. Subject was at this time entered into Foundation records as SCP-321. In the time since, SCP-321's body has continued to age at a decelerated rate, approximately half that of a normal human. Although its aging has been slowed, SCP-321 has continued to grow, showing no signs of stopping despite now being taller than any recorded human. At this point in time, it is believed SCP-321's recuperative abilities stem from overabundant production of stem cells, a result of its interaction upon death with expunged. For a period of time beginning in early 19... The limits of SCP-321's natural heart were reached, and SCP-321 was too tall for blood to be circulated properly. During this period, SCP-321 was restrained physically in order to keep its heart capable of pumping blood to the brain. Despite this, slow decay was evident, and the limits of SCP-321's recuperative abilities were found, as it was not capable of healing damage that was being dealt constantly. Work began in 1948 to create an artificial heart to prolong SCP-321's existence. The heart was completed in 19... Since then, all damage done to SCP-321 has been healed. SCP-321 has a very low intelligence. Everyday activities are a chore for it, and it can take several months to years to teach it to do such things as use utensils for eating. While SCP-321 has fully developed vocal cords, it seems incapable of learning speech, instead crying and making nonsense noises as of those typically heard from infants under the age of six months. July 31st, 18... Requesting SCP-321 be removed from SCP status. Junior Researcher Adam. Request denied. 05... January 10th, 18... Requesting SCP-321 be removed from SCP status. Personnel Director Adam. Request denied. 05 May 3rd, 19 We can learn nothing more from SCP-321, suggesting we remove its SCP designation. Site Director Adam. Site 4 Request denied. 05 June 31st, 19 SCP-321 is to be decommissioned and returned to her family. Effective immediately. 0512. Request denied. This is the final time, Adam. She is not now, nor ever has been, your daughter. If you attempt this again, I will gather the council, and you will be removed. 051. Item number SCP 342. Object class Euclid. Special Containment Procedures SCP-342 can be safely stored in its case file folder, in an envelope stapled to the inside cover, as it poses no danger so long it is not actively used. Said case file folder should be kept in a secure file cabinet in high-value item storage, and protected by a standard array of biological, chemical, mimetic, and physical positive action defenses. Description SCP-342 normally takes the form of a mass transit ticket for the closest form of mass transportation to its current location. At the moment, it takes the form of a train ticket, 
departing from station. When held by a sentient person for any length of time, it will eventually change form into a transit ticket for a form of transportation its holder desires to use. This transformation always takes place when not being directly or indirectly observed. No recordings of SCP-342 changing form exist at this time. SCP-342 is indistinguishable from any valid transit ticket and may be used as such. Should SCP-342 be validated by stamp, tearing off the ticket stub, or disposal, it will reform itself into an unused ticket after a short period of time. SCP Foundation personnel should be on site to recover SCP-342 after the conclusion of any field experiments. Anyone who uses SCP-342 to board a vehicle is unable to exit said vehicle by any means. Once the vehicle ends its route and ceases movement, the user will disappear from this reality. Users report a mounting feeling of dread prior to boarding the vehicle, which increases during the course of the journey and culminates in panic-inducing terror shortly before disappearance. Specific phenomena often resemble acute paranoid schizophrenia and include a perception of increased darkness of the sky outside the vehicle, fog, premature night, or most frequently, dreary, depressing weather, auditory hallucinations, most frequently, misperception of normal announcements by drivers and passengers, i.e., an announcement of the next stop is heard as a declaration that the user will never stop. Normal objects, such as other passengers and non-threatening items, suddenly taking a threatening tone or appearance. An almost pathological fear of the drivers, conductors, and other transit staff. Strange occurrences completely preventing the rider from getting off of the vehicle. The absolute knowledge that it is impossible to get off. Inability to perceive other passengers exiting and entering the vehicle. Users report that other passengers appear to simply appear and vanish from their seats, and in some cases, cannot perceive that a passenger has exited the vehicle, continuing to see them in their seats. Inability to hear or perceive attempts to calm or reason with them. Although the most acute experiences are limited to the user only, bystanders, including agents assigned to observe the subject, do report feelings of uneasiness and will be compelled to exit the vehicle early, seeking other means of transportation. Addendum 342A Object was discovered in Chicago during 1936 by Data Expunged. Case was reopened several years later, as it was hoped that advances in technology would allow for a deeper understanding of Data Expunged. Addendum 342B the importance of retrieving SCP-342 after it is validated for travel cannot be understated. Please see report regarding Dr. Lank incident, in which SCP-342 was not successfully retrieved after validation, resulting in a six-month-long containment breach, causing the disappearances of several New York City civilians. SCP Foundation personnel are requested and required to use any means up to and including impersonation of a peace officer, intimidation, and threats or actual use of deadly force to retrieve the item. Addendum 342C Agent Report Our first experiment with a ticket had a Class D personnel member enter onto a bus using the object. We stationed agents at each of the stops to observe his behavior without actually entering onto the vehicle, a precaution in case everyone who got on was in some way affected. The old reports were vague in this area. Many times he simply sat in place, or paced up and down the aisles. Increasingly, he began to stare outside in horror, and the last few times we could not locate him. At the final point before the bus was to be parked for the night, we saw him pounding on the window with a pleading expression, screaming towards the agents for help as it pulled away, a strange mist filling much of the background behind him. As we could not draw many conclusions from this event, we decided to track down some of the passengers and interrogate them, to hopefully shed some light on what happened. Many were hesitant to talk, or claimed that they did not notice anything, saying they were preoccupied by something or distracted by illness, aches, or feelings of foreboding. We finally found some useful information from three boys, one 15-year-old Caucasian and two 16-year-olds, Hispanic, who were riding the bus near the front for part of the trip. 
We were told that our test subject had tried to leave several times, but his pulling on the stop bell was always ignored, and the doors seemed to close right before he could get out. He would run and just not make it, or walk from a distance and get manipulated into the back of the line. Finally, he sat right at the head of the bus, so he could be close enough to get out in time, but every chance he got, there were too many people swarming on or off for him to leave. Something about this event seemed to bother the boys. One of them was particularly irritated, but could not explain the source. Under hypnosis, he described what to him was a moment of pure dread, that he had seen a few people in the crowd of passengers actually push the man back on, subtly hold him back, or trip him, all while staring ahead innocently, like they didn't even notice that they were doing it. Finally, after shouting at the driver that he wanted to get off for a good 10 minutes, which the driver ignored, aside from requesting that the subject sit still and be quiet. The man went back to his seat, apparently giving up in despair. Two of the boys said that the man actually shrieked and stumbled back to his seat in fright when the driver turned around at him. The other didn't realize that the two were in conflict, which is contrary to his usual habit of avidly looking for and watching fights on the particularly rough inner city buses. After going back to his seat, the boys said they promptly forgot about the subject, most likely because he was not struggling anymore. The next time they saw him, he was three seats back, then five, then seven, but at no point could they recall seeing him stand up from his seat to move further back. This was all they could tell us, and it seemed to cost them plenty to even reveal this. On a side note, at the end of our session, the youngest teen screamed. It was like it swallowed him in the end and promptly had to be hospitalized for extreme psychosis. Addendum 342-D Subway Experiment 2 Note by Supervising Officer Subway Experiment 2 was the first time we had an observer alongside the passenger. Agent Strom paid attention to the smallest details of the Class D personnel's behavior, took various fluid samples, and tested organs, mostly the heart and brain until the man became too aggressive to examine. He also recorded an excellent log of all subjective and objective events. Since the physical examinations provided no special signs, except that the subject was in the midst of a typical nervous breakdown, said information has been placed in Document 342-D Alpha. Only the most relevant information has been included here. The two men bought passage, the prisoner presenting the ticket. Immediately, he became aggravated, and said to the person accepting his ticket, What did you say to me, bitch? Are you threatening me? He was quickly hurried along to avoid an incident, and was almost immediately separated from the agent accompanying him by a pair of security guards. Agent Strom reports that the guards appeared to be in a trance, and attempted to separate him from the user, softly chanting, One at a time, please. Nevertheless, he managed to push his way through by force, although he was forced to knock down one officer who attempted to interpose himself between Agent Strom and the door. On the train, the user became very quiet. Surprising, as he was one of our most violent D-Class personnel. Agent Strom continued testing and interviewing until the prisoner said softly, Let me off this f***ing train. Agent Strom said that they could leave after a few more hours, at which point the user became insanely aggressive and began jumping up and down, off the walls, and swinging on the bars and holders, while howling like a primate. Agent Strom knocked him out with a blow to the head from his truncheon, and handcuffed him to a pole. To assuage civilian fears, he held up a badge that said he was a US Marshal, and went back to his analysis. Physical analysis indicated that the prisoner had entered a REM sleep state after only three minutes which is especially unusual in a subject who had been knocked unconscious. After the subject woke up, Agent Strom made the decision to abort the experiment, and told the D-Class subject that he would help him get off the subway as soon as possible, if he cooperated. Holding him tightly, they attempted to leave, but were prevented from doing so by the crowd. Agent Strom attempted to exit a second time at the next stop, taking the precaution of holding up his badge and ordering all passengers to remain in their seats. Nonetheless, he was prevented from exiting the vehicle by the crowd boarding the train. Agent Strom reported that the prisoner was almost pulled away from him. 
He was unable to determine by what means, but claimed that the hands that pulled him back didn't belong to any passengers. Fortunately, Agent Strom had handcuffed himself to the subject and was able to maintain contact with the D-Class personnel, although his attempt to exit the vehicle was unsuccessful. Now in a state of panic, the prisoner clung to the agent like a frightened child, so tightly that Strom had bruise marks on his chest and arms for days, and screamed several times that the handcuffs were slipping off. In the chaos, Agent Strom's badge was knocked out of his hand, and he sustained a blow to the side of the head. During the ride to the third stop, Agent Strom, in a highly aggravated manner, interrogated the new passengers to find out who had hit him. No one would give him any hint or clues, and many became hysterical at the merest question or touch. One woman began wailing when Agent Strom grabbed her shoulder, although she was later silenced when he began shaking her vigorously. Security cameras record Agent Strom throwing a male passenger to the floor and striking another in the face, while the D-Class personnel wept and clung to his leg. Given the extraordinary circumstances, the Board of Inquiry has chosen not to reprimand him for this lack of control. Agent Strom made a third attempt to get the prisoner off the train, choosing to take a coordinated approach. Using his radio, he communicated with agents at the next stop, despite difficulty due to static interference. Unusually, both sides said they heard the person talk in a quiet, small voice like a frightened child, although both sides reported that they were using raised voices to be heard over the static. It was at this point that the prisoner began beating on the door, screaming to be let off the vehicle. Agent Strom, although sympathetic, warned the user that he would sedate him if he continued. This seemed to dismay the prisoner more than anything else. According to Agent Strom, he stated, No, that's how it started. A lonely dark ride in unknown parts of the country. Travelers and drifters. The unattached. They would fall asleep with a bottle of booze. And oh God, when they woke up they'd still be going. Still be on. Don't you get it? They wake up and even though they slept for hours, they still be on. Who knows where? He then stated his intent to cooperate, and curled up in a fetal position, rocking slowly. At the next stop, Agents Macabjorn, Kinular, Smith, and Jacobs, accompanied by Dr. Gunster, the project head, boarded the subway and began pushing their way through the crowd towards Agent Strom and the subject. Despite efforts to intimidate the crowd, progress was difficult until Agent Smith fired his weapon into the ceiling and threatened deadly force. The subway car was evacuated of all other passengers, and a protective cordon was placed around the subject. Agent Jacobs ordered the driver to shut down the subway. When the driver appeared confused, he ordered that all power to the subway be cut off. SCP Foundation personnel, in the guise of transit authority officers, then evacuated the entire train, platform, and station of all civilians. Agent Strom, Macabjorn, Kinular, and Smith, and Dr. Gunster then attempted to lead the prisoner off the train. Despite all efforts to lead, cajole, and force him off the train, no efforts were successful. Agent Strom ceased his efforts after the prisoner was threatened with deadly force by Agent Smith, screaming at his fellow agents that he's not holding on to anything. There's some kind of wall. Other agents appeared confused, claiming that the subject was maliciously attempting to impede exit by holding onto one of the supporting bars. They continued in this assertion until it was pointed out to them the impossibility that this could take place, given that both of the prisoner's hands were being held by agents at that time. In a last desperate effort to extract the subject, the personnel attempted to dismantle the subway around the user through the use of cutting torches and power tools. Agent Strom remained with the subject, while the others exited to help Foundation personnel prepare. While the equipment was being set up and everyone's backs were turned, the doors closed, and the train immediately started up and pulled away of its own accord. The agents did not manage to catch up to it until the next stop, and passengers immediately filed on, despite their commands not to. Agent Strom was later discovered lying on the subway platform eight kilometers away, 
in a comatose state. One end of his handcuffs was still attached to his own wrist, but the other was empty. Traces of blood found on the metal have been determined to belong to the subject. Addendum 342E Subway Experiment 3 Possibly due to mental trauma from his loss of subject D-342-D, Agent Strom volunteered to be the subject of the next experiment, stating that someone more knowledgeable of our terms and procedures could provide better communication. 057 approved this, after much pleading from Agent Strom. Agent Aaron and Dr. Haber, both close friends of Agent Strom, accompanied him on his trip. The ride on the subway started out normally enough, although Dr. Haber noticed that Agents Aaron and Strom appeared to share a closer understanding of the phenomena experienced by Strom, perhaps as a result of their close friendship. Agent Aaron's empathy allowed Agent Strom to remain coherent and sane for the entire length of the ride, and was able to calmly and rationally talk about seemingly otherworldly events, without breakdown of linguistic and mental functions. For this reason, this experiment was the most useful and rewarding, and a full log of the sequence of events experienced by Agent Strom can be found in the attached documentation. Of particular note, Agent Strom made no effort to leave the subway, or even consider the possibility of doing so. This acceptance of his fate may have allowed an avoidance of mental anguish, as seen in the following log. Dr. Haber, all right, we've got what we need. Now, let's try to get you off this thing. Strom, no. Dr. Haber, excuse me? Strom, it's too risky. Aaron, we could get separated or hurt. We know what happens every time. Something bad. I'm not taking that chance. Dr. Haber, but he's doing so well. Maybe that's all it is. A willpower thing. You're keeping yourself together. You're calm. You're composed. It doesn't control you. That's it. All it takes is a strong will to pass through the gates. Aaron, if there is a test, it's not here. It's at the end of it all. That's where he's going to need us. Need our support. That's where it's going to happen. Strom. Quiet. Dr. Haber. Look, we can't just let him... Here's the stop. I say we at least attempt it. For results. Strom. Morosely. You'll get your results, all right, Doc. At this point, the three personnel attempted to walk to the door. Dr. Haber. Jesus! Aaron. Step back. It was at this point that a homeless man traveling on the train hurled Dr. Haber across the room and broke his neck before being shot four times in the chest by Agent Aaron. Foundation personnel waiting at the next platform quickly evacuated them from the train on stretchers. The vagrant died on the way to base, and although transported in a highly secure ambulance, his body disappeared when passing through an abandoned part of town, specifically under a ruin of a train bridge. Agent Aaron ordered the train evacuated and stated his intention to continue the experiment alone, remaining with Strom. Hallucinations continued as the trip progressed. Agent Aaron reported seeing flickering shadows and strange phenomena, while Strom reported more overt hallucinations, including Agent Aaron's face melting apart to reveal a horned red-faced monster and the very metals and materials of the train beginning to melt like wax and mold and reform strangely. Aaron said he found it extremely difficult to think logically or concentrate, but he persevered to stay attached and talking to an increasingly deranged Strom. This experiment has led to the formation of the idea that the user travels on two separate trains. The first, the four-dimensional vehicle of reality, and the second, a so-called shadow train that overlaps the first. Both trains move at the same rate, with passengers and personnel perceiving one or the other to various degrees, until the real train reaches the end of the line and stops moving while the shadow train continues. According to Agent Aaron, shortly after reaching the end of the line, Agent Strom began to slowly drift forward towards the front of the train, passing through solid material in the process. When pointed out to Agent Strom, Strom became perturbed and began to run towards the back of the train. Upon reaching the midpoint of the third to last car, 
Strom began to pound his fist against the air, stating that he was at the end of the train, and it's moving, it's pulling out of the station, and that he was unable to proceed further. Agent Aaron attempted to halt Agent Strom's progress, but succeeded only in knocking him to the ground, at which point Strom quickly accelerated towards the front of the train, sliding on his stomach. Fingernail marks were later found in the carpet, where he had clawed at the ground in an attempt to halt his progress. Agent Strom passed through the closed conductor's compartment door and into the conductor's compartment, where he immediately began to cry out in terror. Agent Aaron stated at this point that he drew his service revolver and attempted a benevolent termination of Agent Strom, but was unable to do so through the reinforced glass of the conductor's compartment door. His last reported observation of Agent Strom states that he saw a creature, kind of like an enormous spider, but wearing a conductor's hat, looking up from the levers, wrapping Jerry in a web, like a cocoon, and then throwing him through the window, like it was air. The creature then turned towards Agent Aaron and ordered him to exit the train, at which point Agent Aaron lost consciousness from terror. He was later found huddled at the back of the train car with an empty weapon, continuing to pull the trigger on an empty cylinder over and over until the weapon was confiscated from him by personnel. Addendum 342F Dr. Gunther's Supplemental Report We set up several situations to try and discover the controls, parameters, and triggers of SCP-342. First, we used a company bus and a driver that worked for our organization and had the prisoner as the only passenger. Nothing happened, even though the ticket was ripped before entering into the vehicle. We attempted numerous other iterations of the same concept, prisoners entering a company bus along with other agents, and we also had a ticket present to gain entrance. We had them speak of this loudly and obviously, and even denied one agent entrance because he did not have a ticket. Still, the object did not change to resemble a ticket for the fictional transportation system we created. Next we had unaware citizens entering onto our bus, using tickets we had previously distributed. Once again, the ticket did not change, and our rider was able to leave at any time. We then exchanged our company bus driver for drivers hired from newspaper want ads. The drivers seemed confident at first, and were very excited about the prospects we were offering them, but when the prisoner came aboard, either on an empty bus or a full one, the driver suddenly became very bewildered and overwhelmed, saying that the controls for our bus were too advanced or new to him. He didn't understand the dashboard. He was more comfortable with his own bus, and couldn't drive this one, even if the same model bus was used. Attempts to refresh the driver's memories as to the method of operating the bus failed further, until even the steering wheel was considered too complicated. After this failure, it was determined to allow the drivers to use their own buses, making deals with the corporations and public departments in the guise of a higher level government bureaucracy. We had them set aside a special time when they would only pick up the prisoner and when they would stop. Although the bosses were fine with this, when the moment came, the drivers refused to change their routine for egg-headed paper pushers. All of them continued on the preset pathways, saying they were too busy or didn't have the time of day to go different routes just because someone ordered them to. Finally, we made a deal with a driver named Bucky Folesworth that he would pick up our passenger along his normal route and would only switch with another driver, one of our personnel, halfway through. Driver Folesworth was offered considerable compensation, was told that failure to cooperate would result in his termination from employment, was instructed to constantly be in contact with us via radio, and to stop at the fifth stop, park the vehicle, and let one of our agents get on to drive. In hindsight, we realized that perhaps the ticket was luring us closer and closer to this edge by presenting situations that were so close, yet did nothing, in hopes of having us go just one more alteration further until we crossed the line and allowed it to become fully active. When the prisoner neared the bus stop, the ticket turned to resemble a ticket to that specific vehicle. After realizing that this would be another doomed ride, several members of our team cautioned restraint and suggested we should send an agent to accompany the prisoner. The consensus was we did not want to jeopardize a fragile situation that could suddenly fail at the slightest touch. I will admit a personal failing, 
as I was tantalized by the prospect of having one of our own be in control of the phenomena and the vitally important data that could be gathered. Unfortunately, our giddiness and desire not to mess with a very important, perhaps once-in-a-lifetime chance, only damned another person. When the bus driver reached the fifth stop, he halted the vehicle as instructed. However, as he attempted to leave his seat, the brakes on the vehicle failed, allowing the bus to speed down the hill, crushing a little girl crossing the street under its wheels. At first we thought this was an attempt by a CP-342 to lash out against us, at having outwitted it and kept the prisoner out of its grasp. Shortly afterwards, we realized that the important fact was not that the child was killed, but that the bus was still moving and driver Folesworth was still in command of the vehicle. We tried to get into communication with Bucky, but he refused to talk. We thought maybe this was because he felt guilty for the death of the child and was worried he was going to be punished, so we tried to reassure him that if he stopped now, there would be no repercussions. At this, we got the first word from him, a simple no. We knew then that we would have to use physical force to halt the bus. Setting up roadblocks and tire treads, we punctured two of the tires and temporarily managed to tip it over on its side. However, he still somehow managed to get onto the highway and at one point we lost him when he went under the road. When he was found again, he was speeding, going at least 130 miles per hour in the middle of traffic in the opposite direction. At this point, he was a danger to the entire populace, not just a prisoner. We told local law enforcement to stand down and chased after him with cars and helicopters. The last statement we got from him was, I'm not pulling over. I'm a driver, and that's what I do. That's my purpose. I don't need to switch. I can get him where he's going. After this, he shot off the freeway into open space for about 10 seconds before crashing into another lower lane. We don't know if this was intentional or not, as at the same time he veered towards the sides and headed towards the rails at a slant, a bullet was put into his head by an aerial sniper. From reports, the bus hit the ground and exploded into a fiery blaze. There were no survivors, and many bodies were never discovered or declared missing. One report from a bystander, 26-year-old woman driving in the next lane over who was suspended upside down by her seatbelt and sustained a blow to her head from the crash is of particular interest. She states that she saw a second identical bus rise out of the smoke and pull aside the wreck. It opened its door with a large mechanical sound and waited there for a few seconds until out of the flames came a single burning silhouette shaped like a human corpse. This corpse was said to have entered the bus and sat down, which then pulled away, smoothly navigating the pileup before disappearing. We tried the same parameters. Real vehicle, real passenger, real driver who knows what's going on and is in contact. Three more times, but with trains this time. We also had agents stationed at the train each time. However, the same mix-up happened over and over again. The prisoners inexplicably went on the wrong, unsafe train, even if it was clear which one to enter. Somehow, they got disoriented in the mob and entered the incorrect train, one with no personnel, safeties, or special equipment on it, from my assistant Dr. Hopper's log, following his recovery from his prior accident. Dr. Hopper, okay, so you're going to go on that train over there. Prisoner, okay. Dr. Hopper, just present your ticket and get on. There will be a man in a black suit waiting for you near the end. Prisoner, I get it already. Dr. Haber, all right, go. No, to your left. Dr. Rupert, don't get on, stop. Dr. Haber, f. Dr. Rupert, god damn it. Package lost. Damn it. Fing son of a. Agent Ogle, damn it, you morons. You were supposed to track him. What the hell were you doing? Dr. Haber? We were tracking him. We just lost shit, 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 shit. Dr. Rupert. What a senseless waste. Addendum 342G. 
cessation of experimentation order. Somehow in the course of the most recent events, Dr. Haber got his neck stuck in the door when trying to help one of the subjects exit the train. As the train pulled away from the station, he was decapitated when it went past a jutting stone ledge. Because of this and other unmitigatable casualties that happen after every normal experiment, one test subject per experiment, we have decided to end our research. 058, upon our urging, has invoked Statute 62, meaning that no other teams can perform trials on the object without our permission or the overruling of all 12 overseers. We have decided to grant permission if they come to us with a novel test idea, one that has not been done before, as the usual experiments only waste lives and grant us no additional information. On a related note, several civilians have been buzzing on the topic of a haunting. Specifically, some kind of specter on the train systems that carries a mysterious bundle in its lap while riding the trains, roughly the size of a human head. We have taken in several witnesses, but under no amount of hypnosis and drugging could they give a description of the apparition's face, saying it was obscured by darkness, or tell us what was beyond the shoulders at all. Addendum 342H Excerpt from Dr. Gunther's personal log Dr. Johannes Getrim has disappeared from his house today. You can't escape, in the end. A year ago, we tried an experiment where the ticket would be torn but the rider would not get on. Dr. Getram decided to be the one to redeem the ticket, and immediately afterwards, hand it to an agent and walk away to a special on-site protection zone, keeping a journal of his experiences. The journal, attached to the file, speaks of severe anxiety, neurosis, fear, and paranoia. He had unrelenting fear of roads, and often spent the night on site so he would not have to leave. After several weeks of not leaving work and suffering the mental and physical results of that, he was sent to a psychologist for review. He brought up his research and asked to be quarantined for his own safety and others. But the way he went about his plea prejudiced many against him and sent a ripple of disgust over his pathetic antics through the office. His tactics backfired and instead, he was merely shunted off to some small project not even directly involving SCPs. The entire group was becoming more and more fed up with him, arriving late, sweating profusely, and looking disheveled because he had walked the whole way, refusing to accompany any fieldwork that involved getting there by transportation, and especially at his habit of always requesting rides home, both for personal reasons and because his car, a brand new Mercedes, kept breaking down on the way home. After attacking a tow truck driver with his own wrench for telling him he should take a bus home, he was dismissed for an undecided amount of time and confined to house arrest. This morning, thick tire tracks were found on the suburban street where he lives. He was reported missing by his wife, who remembers hearing him say, Well, I guess it's time to go. Neighbors report being woken up by the loud sound of a door opening and the sound of a large vehicle driving away. A suitcase, filled with his clothing, was found by the side of the road. Had he accepted his fate in the end enough to pack? Either way, he apparently didn't need it where he was going. Addendum 342i Excerpt from Dr. Clef's personal log At the risk of sounding melodramatic, SCP-342 has finally taken out its oldest arch nemesis. Three days ago, Dr. Gunster and I were going through some of his old files for archival when he came across the file for SCP-342. Gunster removed 342 from its envelope and laid it on his desk as we discussed the object's history, as well as his own regrets, for the number of lives senselessly lost in the research on this project. Our discussion was cut short by the fact that we had made an appointment to watch a showing of Repo, the genetic opera, with Drs. Wrights and Kondraki later that evening. I noticed that Dr. Gunster became somewhat perturbed shortly after presenting his ticket at the door and asked me to go on ahead and save his seat for him. He arrived shortly after and sat down next to us, although he seemed preoccupied and distressed throughout the show. Given the subject matter, I believe this to be a normal reaction to the grotesqueries on stage. Afterward, as Kondraki, Wrights, and I discussed retiring to a bar for drinks, Dr. Gunster stated that it was time for him to leave. Handing me an envelope and warning me to keep it safe, he thanked me for a splendid evening and wished me the best in my future endeavors. 
He then boarded a taxi cab, which sped off unusually quickly into the night. Upon opening the envelope, I noticed that there were two identical tickets for a seat at the musical, one of which transformed into a $20 bill as we approached a trendy bar with a $20 cover charge. Realizing what had happened, I then proceeded rapidly back to the place where Dr. Gunsler had boarded the taxi and ran back down the street that the taxi had taken, followed closely by my confused colleagues. The street, as it turned out, was an alleyway that ended in a brick wall 50 feet from the street. No trace of Dr. Gunsler has been seen since that time. It is my belief that SCP-342 took the form of Dr. Gunsler's ticket to the musical, redeemed itself of the door, and thus doomed him to the same fate as its prior victims. Dr. Gunsler, upon opening his wallet to purchase a beverage, realized what had happened and returned to the front door to recover SCP-342. Given the SCP's prior murderous history, he must have made the decision not to inform us of the incident, keeping us safely ignorant for the time being. When I think of the amount of mental fortitude it must have required to remain calm during the musical, knowing his inevitable fate, I am struck with a sense of loss at the passing of an inestimably valuable asset to the Foundation. For this reason, I am requesting that this file be permanently sealed and no further experiments be carried out on this item. One disturbing development. Prior reports indicate that SCP-342 can only take the form of a ticket for mass transit, whereas in this case, it took on the form of a ticket for a stage play. I understand that there is a group in the Foundation that is seeking to reopen experimentation on the object in light of these new developments. Further updates as events warrant. Item Number SCP-352 Object Class Keter Special Containment Procedures Containment area is to remain sealed at all times. No human interaction is allowed with SCP-352. Any and all interaction should be carried out via robot or other remote means. Should human interaction become necessary, full hazmat containment protocols should be observed. In addition, security lines must be attached to all personnel. Should any personnel begin to exhibit erratic behavior, they are to be immediately removed from the containment area via the security lines. Any staff reporting hallucinations after interaction with SCP-352 or her hair are to immediately be placed under quarantine. Any staff working in or around the containment area must submit to random psychological and physical testing. Anyone found to be contaminated will be placed into immediate quarantine. Staff attacked by SCP-352 may only be recovered if they have not been bitten by SCP-352. SCP-352 is to be fed only once weekly. Feeding will be discontinued for one month if SCP-352 attacks any personnel. Description SCP-352 appears to be a very old, emaciated woman of indeterminate age and race. SCP-352 speaks Old Russian, but with an accent and dialect that makes translation very difficult. SCP-352 is extremely unwilling to communicate with most of the conversations thus far made primarily of threats or statements of revenge. SCP-352 has never identified herself by any name, and due to her aggressive nature, it has been impossible to determine any background information. SCP-352 possesses a level of strength and speed much higher than what should be possible for a person of her perceived age and physical dimensions, and has been shown moving loads in excess of 200 kilograms with little physical strain and moving at speeds in excess of 70 kilometers an hour. SCP-352 can recover from wounds that would be lethal to a human being, including decapitation and disemboweling. This regeneration can take between several days to several weeks, depending on severity. Internally, SCP-352 appears to be a normal human woman, with muscles, bones, and organs in a state consistent with advanced age. Testing done on tissue samples has been inconclusive. SCP-352 is capable of growing very thin hair-like strands from any part of her body, apparently at will. These strands can grow several meters in an hour, and appear to be at least partially under the control of SCP-352. They have been observed crawling along floors and up walls and other structures. These hairs are clear and nearly invisible to the naked eye 
and appear to be slightly weaker than standard human hair. The strands are also coated in a thin layer of chemical enzyme, identical to the enzyme in the saliva of SCP-352. SCP-352 produces an enzyme that is most concentrated in the saliva and hair, but is present in all bodily tissues of SCP-352. How it is produced, and its exact chemical makeup, are unknown. This enzyme reacts on contact with human tissue and rapidly attacks the nervous system. Symptoms manifest almost immediately and include hallucinations, euphoria, suppression of cognitive or logical thinking, and suppression of pain receptors. This state persists for several days with mild exposure and can become permanent with high exposure. Bites from SCP-352 lead to high exposure in 99.9% .9 of cases. SCP-352 appears to subsist on a carnivorous diet, with a strong preference for human flesh. SCP-352 will create a web of hair and wait for prey to become exposed to the enzyme and become more docile. SCP-352 will often remove and eat the limbs of a prey item to prevent it from wandering away and can take several days to fully devour prey. Humans have been observed to still be in a euphoric state and have no knowledge of the outside world, even as they suffer the loss of limbs and other bodily tissue. Addendum Notes on Recovery SCP-352 was recovered in southern Russia, near the town of Reports of an enchanted forest and a witch who had caused several deaths were initially ignored until reports of the witch being found and captured began to surface. When Foundation agents responded, the town was found deserted. Several bodies were found in varying states of decomposition, and blood trails appeared to show many more bodies being dragged into the enchanted forest. Recovery teams were dispatched and captured SCP-352, but suffered heavy casualties due to SCP-352's attack and exposure to the enzyme. A large amount of hair was recovered as well, and is believed to be the cause of many exposure incidents, with contact being attributed to spider webs or an agent's own hair, and not reported until hallucinations manifested. Addendum Notes on Behavior While SCP-352 prefers any type of human flesh over any other type of meat, it appears to have a special propensity for children between 0 and 2 years of age. After observation of highly elevated levels of cooperation and a reduced tendency to attack staff while consuming flesh of this type, a possible alteration in the current diet is being considered. Addendum The use of SCP-604 and SCP-1680 as a more efficient food source for SCP-352 is currently pending approval from the project director following initial testing. Item Number SCP-377 Object Class Safe Special Containment Procedures SCP-377 is kept in the personnel break room, third cabinet to the left of the refrigerator. Any personnel desiring a cookie from SCP-377 may take one, and only one cookie, every 48 hours, to ensure that all personnel get a share. Personnel read their fortunes at their own risk. Description SCP-377 is a box of LaCroix brand fortune cookies. The box was full when it was recovered from data expunged and has since restocked itself regularly every 12 hours. The cookies within the box are individually wrapped for freshness, according to the box, and are, according to all tests, totally ordinary. Each cookie contains one 18mm by 58mm piece of paper on which a fortune is written in blue ink. All of these properties are consistent with a box of cookies from this brand. However, the fortunes contained within each cookie are not consistent with those provided by the standard product. Fortunes appear to be specific to the individual opening the cookie, and have thus far shown to be 100% accurate, ranging from vague indications of coming success to specific predictions regarding personnel's personal lives. The fortunes are not, however, always positive. It is unknown whether the fortune cookies actively predict future events, or in fact cause future events to occur. 
Document number 377-01. The following is a partial log of some of the more notable fortunes given out by SCP-377. Fortune text. It's a boy. Corresponding result. Subject's wife's water broke less than an hour later. The child was male. Fortune text. The weather is really just not your friend today. Corresponding result. Subject was struck by lightning later on the same day. Subject made a full recovery. Fortune text. Keep playing. You're going to win soon. Corresponding result. Subject was a regular player in the state lottery, buying two lottery tickets a week. Four weeks after receiving this fortune, subject won over 100 million US dollars. Fortune text. Life is laughter. Enjoy it while you can. Corresponding result. Subject suffered an aneurysm, leading to massive hemorrhaging and sudden death. This occurred while the subject was laughing. Fortune text. Duck. Corresponding result. Data expunged. Addendum. Following SCP-377's prediction of the deaths of several personnel, a request was submitted to upgrade SCP-377's class to Keter. These were denied, citing a lack of evidence that SCP-377 had any actual connection to the causes of the deaths. Addendum. Dr. received a fortune reading. You don't have long to live. Dr. was then startled by a guard who entered the break room and began to choke on the cookie. The guard did not know the Heimlich maneuver, and Dr. tragically suffocated and died. This has been regarded as an accident and coincidence. Note from Agent I strongly discourage the recreational use of SCP-377. Knowing the future sucks all the fun out of life. Believe me, I know. Lesson complete. To continue with your orientation training, subscribe to SCP Orientation right now and make sure you don't miss any of our upcoming videos.